Home for most people seems so far away. And it's not far away at all, it's right near you. In fact, home is in you. It's like Jesus said, the kingdom of God is in you. It's in you, it's just that people don't know it. And those who do know it or sense it don't know how to get there. All of us are homeless, no matter what country you're in. All of us are homeless until we find home in our heart. And when you find home in your heart is when you look out at the other people who are actually physically homeless. And I can't go home until you go home. See, that's why I became homeless on purpose so that it will always keep that subject before me. I can't go without them. If they don't go, I don't go. That's the bottom line. And we have the opportunity here in America to lead the world to that place called home, our heart, after the healing takes place. That's got to come first. As long as the person is in pain, they don't know that they're at home. In the heart of downtown Los Angeles, nestled in a parking lot on busy streets, sits a high-tech community its residents call Genesis One. The visionary responsible for this modern-day homeless encampment, Ted Hayes, an activist and homeless man by choice. We have got to allow homeless people to be made responsible. Whether you like me or don't like me or not, it's not the issue. The issue is I still have to be responsible to society at large. So therefore, when I expect of them to do, even in the level of the encampment area, they environment, they must clean up the area, not only the encampment, the immediate encampment, but the whole neighborhood, they do this on a daily basis. They must do their chores. They do security 24 hours a day in shifts. They share food. Uh, we have council meetings, government meetings. We plan, we make policies, we vote, we argue, we agree. Um, that's making them responsible for their lives and for the surrounding community. I mean, it's, it's, I think the whole town is in shock that this relationship has come about. I think the homeless cannot hardly believe it, but it has raised their hopes as you've seen them walking around here working, smiling, because they're building something. No one's gonna help you if you're sitting on the curb crying about how you got hit on the head. Get up and do something, and people will help you, and I have proven that. Hayes would like to see dome villages take the place of homeless encampments across the nation. The city of Los Angeles endorses the project, and even though there are up to 100,000 homeless people in the county, at least temporarily, two dozen men and women are now out of the cold. Linda Joyce, CNN, Los Angeles. If there's a reason why I would live among the homeless, it's because I'd feel guilty about their being homeless, but too cheap to give them a dollar, so I'd probably just li rather <laughs> live with them. In your case, though, you, you had a, obviously other reasons for doing it. I mean, you, you, obviously, you also could have avoided the homeless. You weren't homeless. Were you? No, you can't avoid the homeless, especially when you got a big mouth like mine. Um, I had to run to the homeless because of my upbringing, because of what I believe in the Bible, because of my arguments to God about why doesn't somebody do something for the poor and the homeless and all these bad things. And I was always criticizing people, the government, uh, the civil rights activists, the churches, the rich. And it's like one day God spoke to me. I basically said, he said that I had a big mouth. What do you mean by that, sir? He said, well, you had a big mouth. I said, why? He says, because, look, you're always criticizing everybody. Everything. If you know so much about what's wrong, why don't you fix it? Tell you what, don't bother talking to me anymore for a while until you go out to downtown L.A. and begin working on the problem. I'll meet you there. And literally, I felt that I felt a sort of abandonment, you know, sort of a, um, where are you going? Come back here. I'll meet you downtown. He's out the door. And finally, when I got it, together enough to come downtown, the moment I saw the tent city that was there across the street from LA Times, I had an epiphany and I realized what I had to do. And then he said, see, I told you I'd meet you down here. And we've been cool ever since. What did you go about doing to create the village? Well, for the most part, we had to convince the people convinced the politicians to allow it to come into existence. And that took um, a series of demonstrations, protests, acts of civil disobedience. I went to jail 
many, on numerous occasions, a couple dozen times at least, protesting about this. I wasn't just protesting homelessness, saying homelessness is wrong. We all know that. But I was protesting to demonstrate that I had an idea that could actually work. Okay. No need to criticize something if you don't have an answer for it. Keep my shut. We chose a number of, of 35 residents, from children and babies up to senior citizens. That could be singles, it could be couples, they could be married, they could just be living together, they could be gay, they could be straight, they could have pets, they could not have pets. Black, white, brown, red, yellow, Muslim, Jew, Christian. Yeah, we had them all. I mean, that, that was the... And, and, and they could come and go as they please. It, it, was, it, was, like, it was a microcosm of society. So it, was, it was a little America. So it had everything in it. And what was the difference between Little America and Big America in your... In little America, we had a chance in Little America to re-examine our lives and build, the, build America the way it should be built. Old America, which we were cast out of, they're stuck. Look at them. They're stuck. They can't... They're frigid. They're rigid. They can't change. That's what caused homelessness in the first place. That's why homeless people do not want to go back into that. Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand. I could not force people to leave here knowing there's no place for them to go. So that's why they could stay two, three, four, five years, some people, you know. In most shelter programs, you get six months, nine days, you're out of there. We could have done the same thing here, because the more people we take in and put out over 90 period, you know, constantly doing that, we make money. We still hunt, hey, we took in 100 people this month, and uh, we need per deal. And that's what those cats across the street do. The wizard. This guy's a wizard right here. He done it all. He started the dome homes. He uh, did the murals downtown. His daughter's an Olympic athlete. Get out of here. I mean, this guy ran for mayor and came in seventh against Reardon. Am I right? Or fifth, man. Okay, this guy's. And look at this man's hands. This guy's got the hands that shake all the way through. Those are the real hands. Hands of working man. This guy's Ted Hayes. Tony, Tony. I used to have the shop down the street from you guys there. Oh. Yeah, the, the art studio. Still got it. I always, I miss the domes because those, they kept my neighborhood clean. No, you ever see it down there now? Uh, and now it's terrible. Now it's terrible. I miss you guys there. That's what are you Rhonda. doing now? That's Rhonda. Hi, Rhonda. Yeah. It's, it's, it's how you treat people. And that's what this was about. How you love your neighbor as yourself, which is a basic Judeo Christian concept in this so-called Judeo-Christian society. This should be the norm of our behavior, and that's what that was. We were, we, were, we were acting like human beings ought to act. At least that's what we were striving for, to be that way. I'm the one, this brother know, he helped us all. A lot of us who were broke, who were poor, they told you, crisis is coming, but I'm gonna still be here. I'm broke today, I ain't worried. God got my back. I'm a rich man. I'm a star. I'm the skid row father. Dome Village is not the end. That's the halfway house. That's the, that's the bus stop, so to speak. That's on your way home. What you would do, basically, is you break off a piece of Los Angeles and transplant it away from here, form a military base, abandoned town, a large tract of land where you can actually build a planned community. And you bring in, you bring in um, employment opportunities such as manufacturing. You don't pay them, however, what you would pay here in LA. Because there, the cost of living is not as high as it is here. And what happens there while you're there, you go to school, with your children, you have a house, you, it's your home, your house, as long as you live there, come and go as you please. But if you move, back to downtown LA, because you want to try this again, you lose the ownership of that house and another family gets that house. But you can have that house forever, as long as you reside there and live there. 
It's a home for the homeless within a home for the homeless, which his country is in the first place. So, and, and, and there would be a mixture, not just homeless people. There'd be guys like you and us living there too. Guys who are sick of that. And we want a new life. It's just that we have a lot of smarts, talented, resourceful, and, and we don't want to go that way. We'd rather hang out with these folks and mix. We, we call that the domestic peace corps. None of this actually makes them responsible. It just yeah, it kind does. of heals it. Well, if they make them responsible, then the minute you walk away, they, they start to they start to it's, hit them. It's bottle. like it's like therapy. It's like therapy. You break a leg, and you go through therapy. You go through therapy till you finally go through all that pain, and you're leaning on somebody, you're leaning on a stick, and eventually you're back to doing what you were doing. We were never able to offer consistency to that. Had we had more people like you guys, for example living in with us, we could have walked them to health. I see an opportunity here, not only for these folks, but I see a way to pull the Tea Party in and uh, conservatives, liberals, Americans in to finally healing this nation of the slave race wound. It's no accident that black people are 17 to 18 percent of the unemployment rate in this country, twice that of white folks in this country. That's no accident. We've, we've always, we've always led the country in those kind of statistics. Why is that? Because we're lazy? No good? No, it's because we come from a heritage of enslavement and Jim Crow racist laws that has destroyed us for generations to come. You need a moral issue, a moral cause. You just can't talk money. You flip the script, and they were rich and wealthy in Wall Street. They would have the same attitude, you know speaking. Human beings are human beings. But what if all these young, predominantly white children would get behind the car to the homeless? Which, skid row, homelessness. I fear for the homeless because they're not going to do anything for the homeless. They don't have anything to give to the homeless except to take away their, pro their, their space. Like, this, is less, <laughs> this is less space for the homeless. Go to Wall Street and tell the Wall Street brokers, not ask them for a donation, but to show them or tell them that they needed to invest in business ideals for people at the bottom of American society. And we believe that if you can fix the bottom of American society, you can fix every other level in America. Well, if there's a hole in the bottom of the ship, no matter what you do for the people on the upper levels, you can't save the ship. But if you go down to the bottom where the poor are and you fix the hole in the bottom of the ship, everybody is saved. You got people sleeping all over there. You got over 160 people out here. Three whites sleep in my spot. This was my spot. Right here. And go to sleep. This is my spot. Way back in the 80s. I used to live here. Before you were born. I used to live right here, man. And they used to chase us away. The homeless, they chase us away. But they can't chase you away. Occupy. Occupy. Yeah. Occupy. 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 For years, Hayes preached to anyone who would listen, there is a better way for the homeless to live. In the mid-80s, he challenged city ordinances by housing dozens of homeless in Tent City. Today in its place sits this portable dome village, the product of hard work and a grant from the Arco Company. We were supposed to only been here for two years. And it's supposed to have, have uh, transitioned into those four phases to build the planned cities and all that stuff. Well, those guys recognized the power of it and shut it down. We got stuck, as it were, like an invading army on a beachhead. And we just couldn't get off the beach. We stayed here for 13 years, languishing, trying to get off the beach. They wouldn't let us off the beach. Why did they hate you so much at some point? Because they, they felt their jobs were threatened. They feared they would lose political power. Um, they won't be as important in the sight of the government officials and corporations and individuals who give money and people who give money out there to just causes. They figured it would all go to me and my group, and they would have no more, see? And they would lose their political clout. I'm just this naive guy running around, hey, we're gonna help the homeless, we're gonna empower the homeless, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make them responsible citizens and pay taxes and be like everybody else in the American dream. 
I believe that. But after going to meetings and being rejected time and time and again and offering good ideas, after a while, like baby Huey, I caught on. <laughs> they, they want to kill me. They want to kill these people. natural instincts and what I read in scriptures, the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, and of moving out of what the activists and the advocates themselves said they wanted to do. That's what was motivating me, okay? And as I would do these things, like, like encourage them to get off of welfare, try to start businesses, those kinds of capitalist ideas, taking responsibility for yourself, like I would teach you. If you live in a cardboard box over there in that field, fine. At least keep the area around your cardboard box clean and neat. And, 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 and don't bother people. Be a responsible citizen wherever you are. And they didn't like that. See? So they began to call me a conservative and a Republican. Me. I took offense to that. Don't you call me no conservative. Republican, my mind, a conservative Republican, a bunch of redneck racist, don't, don't, capitalists who don't care about nobody, don't call me that. If helping people to become civil and being productive citizens is a redneck racist Republican capitalist, then that's what I am. White at that. And your neck, red see? goes well on your See? Mind. My father was a soldier, a Buffalo soldier. He fought for this country in World War II and Korea. He shed his blood for this country. I am his son. I am born on this terracotta. I am an American, and so are you. And you better start realizing it. We Americans, white, black, brown, and yellow, we must get off the defense and get on the offense. We must stop. We must stop blocking blows and start giving blows. You let a bully push you around, he will continue to push you around. Can you imagine? My name is George Shen, and I'm a director on the board of uh, Dome Village. And uh, I want to start today by thanking everybody for joining us and giving us their support. <laughs> and uh, um, we basically want to tell you that uh, before Christmas, we got a Christmas gift from our landlord, and that is basically an effective eviction of Dome Village. Not only with Dome Village, but you know, 30 some odd residents gonna be evicted out of here. Um, the landlord has increased the rent from $2,500 a month to $18,000 a month. The board held a meeting. We spoke to the, the landlord and his basic idea was whether or not we can come up with the rent, the increased rent, we're gonna be out of here. And the reason why he did that is because he's against free speech and he doesn't believe that members of our board or members of our organization should, should, should show support to our troop and be patriotic. So I've got to be careful today because there's so much that wants to come out and I want you to walk away from here today seeing me in a greater light and supporting where I'm coming from. Before I do that, I want to introduce some of my brothers who came down with me from Los Angeles. Les, uh, Leslie Jordan over here. Leslie, raise up your hand there. Chester and Marcus. That's one, two, three, four, five of us. <laughs> Whole bunch of us. They say four or five black men are like 500. My name is uh, Zane Smith uh, from Children with Wings Youth Foundation. This here is Walter Wheeler. And we, we do gang prevention. And we're here to support Ted Hayes. Um, we, we really thank Ted for what he's doing in our community. And when I come over here, Ted opens up the conference room to us to have meetings on our own where we don't have to pay. Oh, yeah. And it's been a benefic benefit to us as gang prevention uh, organization. Ted, I'm proud of you, man. Okay? 
And that's all I have to say. Squeak at me, baby. You know, uh, I've been here also with Zane. I've noticed this is a model city that can be duplicated around the country. Instead of uh, 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 throwing them to the curb, this should be something that should be really looked at because there's a, a positive situation for people who are trying to do something for themselves. Thank you. The Compton Cricket Club. There's no way people could actually imagine cricket and Compton in, in the same sentence because it's totally opposites. You know, you have Compton has this image of gangsterism, uh, killings, uh, everything that everything that's bad versus cricket that's everything that's good. So it's you know it's an oxymoron. Nicknamed the Homies and the Pops, the team was founded in 1995 by homeless activist Ted Hayes and film producer Katie Haber. Having worked together at the Dome Village, a homeless community in downtown Los Angeles, Katie introduced Ted to the sport when the Beverly Hills and Hollywood Cricket Club needed an extra player. Cricket is the antithesis of what the kids are getting involved in now. Cricket is, is dignified. Cricket is well-mannered. Cricket, as I said, teaches you a lifestyle. Originally called the LA Cricket, the team was made up primarily of homeless players. But back when we filmed with them, it also included former gang members. A regular participant in the LA Social Cricket Alliance League, the club's aim was to address homelessness and to curb the negative effects of gang activities amongst the youth of inner city Los Angeles through the principles of cricket. <laughs> cricket goes beyond the boundary, I believe. If you go onto the cricket field with that kind of thinking, by the time the game is over, when you leave the field, you are a much better person that came on the field in the first place. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Hey, brother. Bless you, my brother. Did you get my email? Yes, I, I will talk about, about it. I talked about it on a couple of weeks. I invited you to speak at my big event. Oh, I don't know. I did that. Dude, it's May 20th. And finally. I'm not exonerating what Christians and Jews and Europeans and Americans did in, in slavery. I'm not, I'm not saying that's irrelevant. It is relevant. And you pretty much have admitted it. As far as I'm concerned, since the 1960s, White Americans, Americans who are white, have come closer as a people to black folks than we have to you. That's not because we don't want to be near you. That's what the whole integration movement was about. That's what it was about. It's just that our leaders have refused to allow it to happen. It seems, however, that whenever a black person or a brown person, or brown person male or female, if they rise to prominence, they say that they are Republican, they get attacked. You take the guy in Maryland right now, Michael Steele, running for senator. He's a black man. But because he's a Republican, he's being lambasted. They're throwing Oreo cookies at this man. Condoleezza Rice, Judge Thomas, across the board. There's a phenomenon happening in this country. America needs to discuss this matter and particularly within us minority people, we need to find out why this is going on and put an end to it. So All that's right. what it's about. Right. You know, William, had he called me up weeks ago, months ago, whatever, or just the other day and said, you know what, Ted? It's time for you guys to go. I want to develop my property. I'm going to sell it. You know what we would said? See ya. Thank you very much. No, no repercussions at all. We would call a news conference, of course, and say, hey, we've got to go. Can you guys help us out? But I, we believe in the absolute right of private property owners, and we will not divest this man of his property. In fact, it's my vision and, and intent to have us out of here with your help by March 31st. Give this man his property while he can have it, and we're gone. See, that's what we want to do. We don't want that best of us. We don't want to hold him up in court. We could. We're not going to do that. He has a right to his property. He wants to charge $20 million a month for, for, for rent. That's his prerogative, and we'll stand with it. What we don't stand for is his political prejudice. It's taking my freedom and these people's freedom to express themselves politically. The Civil War attracted me because it, it was a pivotal part of our country's history. It took us from being a country of, you know, independent, semi-independent states to being, uh, you know, one cohesive, cohesive country, yeah.
I mean, I know a lot, but most of that came out of the Civil War. So why'd you choose the Confederate side? Um, I'll, I'll, well, historically, my great-grandfather was a Confederate. Confederate? So, okay. um, out of Texas. So, I mean, that, that fit a little bit, too. But it, it, it was more of making sure that, that my daughter and my son could come out here and spend a weekend kind of learning about history, seeing about things with no cell phones and no video games and, and right. uh, just interacting with people, you know? I was I was gonna go I was gonna go to homeschool, but my parents didn't think I would graduate. <laughs> I know homeschool can be a challenge. At times. I was I in public it. school. <laughs> That's the best one. <laughs> the country goes into this convulsion of talking about race and 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 slavery, and it's always a one-way lecture from these so-called African-American leaders to white folks about white people's racism and how white people need to transform themselves, how white people are bad, and white people sit there and go, you've been this way, you've been that way, you've been this way, you've been that way, trying to please. And all that's done since we've been doing that is the state and the state of black people in this country is getting worse and worse and worse. Daniel said his skin was like brass burned in the fire. And his hair was white like wool. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We do have books available here at the front counter. And, and you all say black people, we gotta unite, we gotta unite. If we can't unite, why can't we unite? Because we don't like each other. It's deep within our genetic memory. For hundreds, thousands of years, I don't like that fool over there. Why? I don't want somebody to like. As much as we blame the white man, and correctly so, for the things he's done, why is it we kill the black man? If you want to get the white man, there's enough white dudes out there, you ain't got to aim. You will hit one. If it's the white man that makes me sell crack to my brother and sister, if it's a white man who gives me guns to shoot my brother, then why don't we go get him? Because it ain't in us to do it, that's why. Because our anger is with ourselves. And I believe that if we would just mirror ourselves, throw the white man out the door for a minute, we'll, we'll deal with the thief later. We really can't deal with that cat until we deal with ourselves. We do that, heal ourselves up, we can take on anybody in the world. Because we laid the foundation of civilization. We are the elders. These are our children. They learn from us, remember? We got the smarts. We know the black God. The foundation of this nation is particularly between black and white and Native Americans. Primarily those three elements. Primarily black and white. Slavery. Slaves built this nation. Not willfully. They made us build it. And that has caused a wound that is, is a wound between black and white people. When the black and the white people heal, everybody else will fall in order because they came on the backs I of our citizens. That's what I'm saying. When the white folks heal. And black folks heal. Primarily black folks. Yes. Your definition of heal. Heal would mean that, that the pain of slavery and racism is gone where we heal can... Heal me. Can, let me finish, please, sir. Sir, may I finish? Get rid of all pain. Sir. Can I finish what I'm saying first? I'm listening. All right. Heal means that the pain of race, slavery, is gone. The scars may remain. It will never Let leave. me finish, sir. The scars may yes. remain to remind us of the pain we once had, so we will never come back that way again, that we will live finally as human beings. Anybody in denial live in stress and their head will hurt, and they have all kind of weird feelings and emotions, okay? And their body eventually is gonna get sick. And everybody around them begin to be affected by that denial, all right? The day that the person stops being in denial, the stress leaves, the headaches start going, the emotions start working out, the mind starts sticking clear, the body begins to heal, the relationships around that person begins to develop. You begin to think thoughts you never thought before. You begin to figure out how to do stuff because you no longer deny it. But what's 
what specifically, what kind of thing eliminates denial? Truth. Like this guy down here. He has freed himself in the rat race. Well, I don't think he did it on purpose. I did. He did not do it on purpose. He got kicked out. And once he was out, he's like a slave that inver inadvertently found himself off the plantation, tasted freedom, and then would rather die in the filth of the swamp or be eaten by the dogs before he'd be taken back into slavery. And that's the hard mindset of the average homeless person that's out here. It sounds like from that perspective, they should be helping us. The homeless should be helping the, uh, the, Hello. the, the constraint. Hello, that's exactly the point. And that's where, remember going back to the story we talked about, go west, young man. As young immigrants moved across America, they discovered new kinds of food, clothing, music, culture, science, everything changed. They had something as homeless people to offer the world if they ever got established. Same with these folks. If they ever got established, they have something good to offer the world. <laughs> We need healing as the issue. We need healing. Every single human being on this planet needs healing. We've always, as human beings, need healing. We were born, as it were, into a painful world. And we pick up these wounds as children. And we never get them healed. And we run around as adults behaving in weird, quirky ways. And most of us don't even know why we behave the way we behave. And we hate the way we behave. But we don't know nothing else. In 1997, the homies toured England for the first time <laughs> with the help of some major sponsors. That's the London Dungeon, by the way. They enjoyed that immensely. In, <laughs> it included a game in Hambledon, which launched our pilgrimage to the birthplace of cricket on all our subsequent tours. While visiting the Houses of Parliament, we bumped into Gerry Adams, president of the Sinn Féin party, who invited us to visit him in Northern Ireland. On our 99 tour, we did indeed incorporate a trip to Northern Ireland. A cricket match against the British civil servant team was complemented by a game of hurling against a Catholic team, a game the homies learned specifically for the, for the tour, and I think I almost killed them. It's the most dangerous sport you can imagine, but they learned it. In a pre-arranged meeting by Mo Molan, the then Secretary of State, as a sign of peace and goodwill, the team presented the head of the Ulster Unionist, David Trimble, with a hurling stick. And to Jerry Adams, leader of the Sinn Féin, we presented a British cricket bat. The Compton homies were not only officially involved in international politics, but had first-hand knowledge of what 800 years of urban violence can do to a nation. In 1999 and 2001, we accepted Prince Edward's kind invitation and visited in both his homes, Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle, where we played cricket against the Windsor Castle staff and serenaded His Royal Highness in the clubhouse with Theo and Isaac Hayes' cricket rap, from bullets to balls, from gats to bats, we're playing cricket. As a team, they've gotten pretty far. In the spring of 1997, sponsored by Prudential and Tommy Boy Records, the homies and the pops toured England. Suddenly, this group of homeless men and ragtag kids, many of whom had never been out of Compton, found themselves having tea with Prince Edward in Buckingham Palace. I could have done worthy things in England. I could have, you know, come to great heights in the movie business. 
I know I never would have walked into Buckingham Palace into the private residence of Prince Edward and had tea with him. But it took a bunch of gangbangers from Compton to get me there. We've got to go down and get amongst the young and give them something to believe in. Again. You know, we go through that rebellious stage. All human beings go through it. But in our hearts, as young people, we want some older guy to tell us what to do with our lives. Because we don't know. We don't know. But all the guys are like, man, I can't get out there. Those are young people, man. They won't accept me. That's not true. That's not true at all. At something like a solutions committee, someone simply posits idea. And then the people who are there to help contribute to seeing it happen can be there to see it happen. For so, individual proposals to put you down on stack. Why can't it go to a committee? You can go to a committee, but the, the with, only way... Myself, if you go to a committee, to then the committee will bring it up. What is up. See, the committee... See, see, the actual committee on. voted unanimously on it. Okay, then, then the committee has to bring it up, then. I've been trying for three weeks for this, and they keep dropping the ball. You know, they keep dropping it. I'm sorry that wasn't in the question, but yes, my question was answered. That's right. Now, all I can do now tonight is make an announcement. That's like 30 seconds. Okay, is there any I want to speak again against that uh, because I, I think it was said earlier we already have enough uh, committees this might clear this up I think there's a semantic difference between committees and affinity groups and you, we go first time around second time around and they, they are like children the innocent lambs that instinctively feel that something is horribly wrong in this country and in the world that's a good thing the problem is they don't know what to do look at that <laughs> Now, hi, show me. This, 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 is, this is a routine here, okay? We practiced this for a whole month. You're gonna show me how to do that, right? A little music, please. Oh, that's okay. Just show me the step. Right here. Like that? They're all different. Let's, okay, let's do one together. Let's, let's just do a step one. When you have people can inspire vision, people come out to apathy. They find a reason to live, something bigger than their own lives, because people get bored with their own lives after a while. And, and they say, ah, whatever. But if you give a people a vision, they will rise up and overcome any obstacle. Thank you, Sarah! My niece! When the human spirit is allowed space, resources, and freedom, they will cultivate themselves and the environment to where they can re-enter the marketplace. Isn't that what America is built on? All we need is space, opportunity, resources, and the freedom, and we'll make this country even greater than what it is now. I can bring people to a patriotic fervor but I don't get invited back. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? I speak, they cheer, we, I wave the flag, this is mine. They don't call me back. Not the people, the leadership. The leadership, because the leadership knows that not only am I going to go after the enemy invaders, yes, I go after them with a sharp sword. But my sword has two edges on it. It cuts back the other way. We have got to start examining ourselves. Why are we losing the fight? I believe that our country is suffering from a slave race wound that has never been healed in this country primarily because we have not had the proper doctors and medicine to deal with it. We are bleeding. And like any, any wound that is left open and untreated, it will draw flies, vector, and disease. You wonder why our country is, 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 is the way it is? Because the wound has not been healed. Fire!
King mentioned this in 1963 in the I Have a Dream speech. He said that, that, um, that the destiny of white people in this country and the destiny of black people in this country are tied together. That our freedom is your freedom, your freedom is our freedom. And what I learned is that actually we are not just citizens together or brothers and sisters or even twins. We are conjoined twins. damage and, and that's not that's not my idea that's in the bible you know it's on our dna wall all have sinned and come short of the glory of god god had something for us special as human beings to be it's not like it's over i think we're going to really find it after all we've all come to the human bubble we're all here this is it we can actually change this thing we can do it unprecedented human history <laughs> 